activists say our future is dismal. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. Oh man, we decided on our future. If it's not climate change, it's homophobia. It's very stressful, like people don't know whether we're gonna have rights next year or not. The activists say they fight to save people from homophobia, racism, hate groups, and climate change. <laughs> Listening to them, you'd think these threats are getting worse. But the opposite is true. Our air and water are cleaner. We live longer, healthier lives. There's less racism than there used to be. Less homophobia, too. But if the protesters acknowledge that, what would they do with their lives? Journalist John Tierney covered activists for years. In 1979, I was a reporter at the Washington Star, and I was assigned to cover the first anti-nuclear march. Thousands protested nuclear power. An end to the nuclear age in its entirety. And I interviewed the organizers, and I was just struck that all of them were veterans of the anti-war movement. How did they all suddenly become so passionate and so knowledgeable about nuclear power? And then it was later I realized, well, of course, the Vietnam War was over. You know, they succeeded, so they needed to find a new cause. For activists, success is a threat. You know, it, it's, it's going to put you out of business unless you find a new cause. But it's not a business. They're not making money doing this. Oh, yes, they are. Environmental activists probably collect the most. Their leaders pay themselves hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars. Racial equity groups have gotten rich, too. Although when it comes to deceitful self-dealing, Tierney says... The ultimate example is the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center released a chilling report. When the center opened, it promised legal help to those harmed by racism. After their lawsuits bankrupted chapters of the Ku Klux Klan, the center changed Klan Watch to Hate Watch. Fabricating these, you know, the idea that there's a rising tide of hate in this country. And they just fundraise with that, and it scares people, and they get money. They think they're making the world a better place. But they're not. They're viciously attacking and smearing. Groups like Moms for Liberty. Moms for America. We put about 10 of these major hate groups out of business. They're just scaremongering and giving people the idea that there's all this hatred and racism in the country when all the evidence shows just the reverse. The head of the group once said he'd stop fundraising if they ever got the $55 million. Well, now they have over $600 million in the bank and they haven't stopped fundraising. Tierney wrote a book detailing why people fall for such bad news. In The Power of Bad, you explain that we're programmed to see bad because if our ancestors didn't see the saber-toothed tiger, they were dead and they didn't give birth to us. Exactly. The ones who paid attention to threats were the ones who survived. Our brains are hardwired to react strongly to fear, and activists take advantage of that. There's this industry, the merchants of bad, who get more money by creating crises or pretending that crises exist. They're journalists, they're activists, they're lawyers, they're academics, and they're bureaucrats because, you know, the bigger the problem sounds, the bigger your budget. And the more attention you get. You get more attention, you get more money. I mean, nobody gives you money to study something that isn't a problem. But if it's a crisis, then we all have to pay attention. And, and you get not only money, but you get power. That appeals to politicians. Climate change is literally an existential threat to our nation and to the world. You know, climate change is kind of the perfect crisis because you can attribute anything to it, and it's always in the future. <laughs> And it's bizarre that environmentalists call this an existential threat. An existential threat to us as human beings. I don't even think most Americans know what the word existential means. <laughs> and yet, they're all using it. The greatest existential threat. This is the existential threat. The existential threat of climate change. Yeah, it, it's a great phrase. You know, during the 20th century, environmentalists warned us that overpopulation, we were all going to starve to death. In the next 15 years, the end will come. And by the end, I mean an utter breakdown of the capacity of the planet to support humanity. The opposite happened. Now there are more than twice as many people and fewer starve. Now it's climate activists predicting human extinction. What I'm saying is the planet's on fire. And the idea that with our advanced technology today, we, we can't survive, uh, you know, a slight rise in temperatures, it is just absurd. But wait, 
News channels like NBC now say storms are getting stronger and more dangerous because of human driven climate change. These events that are boosted by climate change, stronger, wetter, lasting longer. But that's just not true. There's been no long term growth in the intensity um, or the number of hurricanes. But every time one comes, it's, it, you know, it's a great photo op for the crisis industry to say, oh, this is climate change. The crisis industry also claims in America, it's unsafe to be gay. You do realize that outside countries view America as oppressive, right? Like we literally have travel warnings to go to your country because of how many people are killed, but also for queer people, it's not a safe country. There's no place on earth where gays are more welcome than in the United States. Cities compete to have the best gay pride parade. Nobody in the world celebrates pride like our city. Yet the human rights campaign declared a national emergency for members of the LGBTQ plus community. Aren't they talking about a real problem? No, you know, last year, uh, public support for gay rights reached an all-time high. Strangely, that was reported by the very same group that declared the national emergency. Gays can marry in every state. There's no stigma against homosexuality. I mean, gay characters used to be taboo on, on television. Now they're practically obligatory. You and Daddy are gay, so I'm gay. Oh. oh! An anti-gay slur is this career suicide today. But these activists need to declare some kind of emergency. After Florida passed laws restricting things like discussion of sexual identity and government-funded schools, activists issued a travel advisory for Florida in particular. It, it wasn't safe for gays to go to Florida. I mean, it's absurd telling gays you're not safe in Miami. I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> Trans activists even claim genocide. I am going to spend the next minute screaming. That is what the trans genocide in this country, in this city, has brought me to. I have no idea what she's even talking about. Imagine that! There has never been more public acceptance than now of trans people. The idea that it's not safe for them or that they're there's a genocide is just ridiculous. But she really believes it. They're really upset. There are professional activists who need a cause, and then there are emotionally disturbed people who, you know, who glom onto something to work out their personal problems. And then there's today's spin on racism. We know that America systemically, structurally, is a racist country. <laughs> of course America is a racist country. How did this fundamentally racist country elect Barack Obama and re-elect him? And public surveys about racism have just shown this consistent decline. I mean, there's even been a decline, for instance, in the search for racist jokes on the internet. People are more committed than ever to treating everyone the same. There was the George Floyd killing. But that was a very rare event. Studies do not show there's any racial bias in police shootings. And taking one death and turning that into a national reckoning with race. That was incredibly lucrative for activists. It sure was. They collected billions. BLM itself collected $90 million. Where did it go? They bought mansions. Right. It was a great business opportunity for them. BLM leaders spent millions on themselves, $12 million on luxury properties. Also, their protests got police to pull back. And the fact that, that it actually led to, it, to thousands of additional black deaths, that, that hasn't stopped them. What do you mean led to black deaths? The war on the police that was started has caused police to stop doing things they used to do. It's called the Ferguson effect. Anger exploding in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. And as a result of that, there's been a huge spike in homicides and in violence, and the chief victims of that have been black. The post-George Floyd riots resulted in an excess of over 15,000 black male deaths. Better not point that out on CNN. You're literally making a connection out of your own conjecture. No, you cannot. Just it's a real do thing. That. Look up. Look up the Ferguson effect. Look up the Floyd effect. It is a real term. You cannot. You cannot. It's a just, real term. I didn't make this just up. Invent a connection between two things. The activists and most of the public have no idea that this is what has happened. Activists are often oblivious to the problems their activism creates. A final example the deceitful attack on vaping. Chris, no amount of nicotine is safe. Stop flavored e-cigarettes. Get the facts at Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. One of the great public health advances this century has been vaping. 
Once vaping devices were introduced, smoking rates plummeted to historic lows. Lots of lives are saved because vaping's much less harmful than smoking. But this was a huge threat to the anti-smoking activists because if people were quitting on their own, what happens to us? So they d started scaring people about vaping. It can release dangerous chemicals like formaldehyde into your bloodstream. And they have succeeded in persuading most people, according to polls, that vaping is as dangerous as smoking. That is a horrible thing to do to the public, but it's been very good for the campaign for tobacco-free kids. It's great for their careers. It's terrible for public health. We invited the campaign to appear here to argue their side. They didn't respond. I repeatedly ask activists to appear here, tell your side of the story. They almost never do. Are there any examples of activist groups where they said, okay, great, we've solved it now, and they dissolve? I can't think of any. If you want to see more of our videos that question popular but wrong views on important issues, please subscribe down below. Thank <laughs> you.